Upon first exploring the sublime website singthehours.org, there is one question Paul Rose wants to answer. Why sing the hours? And the answer is quite simple. The purpose of the project is prayer. Paul Rose on singing the Liturgy of the Hours now. My name is Todd Warner, and this is the Evangelization and Culture Podcast from Word on Fire. Paul Rose is the creator of Sing the Hours, a new media and music ministry dedicated to singing the, the Liturgy of the Hours, also known as a divine office. Paul grew up in San Jose, California, amidst seven siblings. A lifelong student, Paul has a background in vocals and music production. Though raised an evangelical Christian, Paul was received in the Catholic Church as a freshman in high school. Paul believes in leading with beauty, and the church's sung liturgy is its most powerful tool of evangelization. Professionally, Paul has been a public speaking coach for more than a decade and is the co-founder of Rose Debates Institute. Paul currently lives in Boston, Massachusetts with his wife, Julia, where they enjoy hosting feast day parties, going to Red Sox games, and sipping cappuccini on the porch when the weather allows. Since creating Sing the Hours in 2020, Paul has been singing and posting two offices per day, sung in both English and Latin, which can be found on all podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Paul Rose, welcome. Thank you so much, Todd. Segment one, beckoned by the Holy Spirit. In an article profiling Paul Rose in his website, singthehours.org, Angelus News said, Paul was raised as what he calls a postmodern, non-denominational Christian, but in high school, he was beckoned to the church by the Holy Spirit. So Paul, what does it mean to be a postmodern, non-denominational Christian, and how would you describe your religious upbringing? It's a great question. So my, my church up when I was growing up calls itself an interdenominational church. Hmm. And I feel like a lot of the, um, a lot of the churches that my friends went to, they all had sort of a unique spin. And I think what makes the non-denominational Christianity of today, quote unquote, postmodern is it's strive towards granular uniqueness. So there's, hmm. there's not like a, a cohesive communion, like in times of yore, Protestants had, you know, the, a large Lutheran communion, typically a large Methodist communion, which you can still find today, but that's sort of the more more passe in terms of what's what's in vogue in general evangelicalism. It's more these isolated non-denominational um, sort of large Bible study groups, you could almost say. Um, and that's the, the upbringing that I was raised in. However, on on one key point, it it was less quote unquote postmodern. There's this postmodern de-emphasis of baptism to mm -hmm. the point where baptism in evangelical Christianity is is hardly practiced at all. And what I mean by that is I and I, I'm I you know I could get some some pushback, but you could get pushback in terms of trying to define non-denominational Christianity yeah. from yeah. anyone because everybody's different. So I'm yeah. I'm I'm not meaning to make a a total generalization, but my uh, my wife was, for example, raised in a very devout, wonderful, non-denominational family. And uh, by the time she's in college, and uh, she and I started dating uh, towards the end of her college career, she had never even been baptized. Mm. And um, she had never even been taught. Like, when I was growing up, um, in our particular flavor of non-denominational, interdenominational Christianity, at, at least there was a, you know, Christ... Uh, told us we had to be baptized, and even if it doesn't mean anything, yeah. it should be done out of obedience. If it doesn't mean anything, a couple generations later, you're going to get what, that's why I affectionately call it postmodern Christianity, where if it's meaningless, then why do it even out of obedience? And so there was, there's no urgency generally. It's the current trend. Yeah. Um, and again, you can't generalize, but if you were to generalize, there is a, a further and further de-emphasis on baptism. And the reason why I'd call that also postmodern is because um, that then is a rupture with most Protestantism of yeah. the past. Like Martin Luther, um, he authorized the burning at the stake of parents who didn't baptize their children. And he writes very, very um, profoundly, but also it, it's kind of a, it's kind of crazy, the, the, distinction between his worldview where he says 
it is very, very violent what we're prescribing here, but it's a far greater violence to the soul of, yeah, yeah. you know, these, these poor children to not baptize them. So you have that as one extreme, and that's still Protestantism, right, yeah, for yeah. hundreds of years. And um, now you have a world where baptism is far from necessary, um, and if it's done, it's done as something you do over and over again as a sign to everybody that you take your faith seriously or something, and um, it's different for everybody. But anyway, that's that's what I mean by, so I, I would say in a word, it's the, it's the individuality of these churches that make them postmodern. Um, it's kind of like... Our, our culture of individualism applied more corporately. And then also um, the de-emphasis of baptism itself is, is a significant enough point to become its own thing. So, yeah. so you're, so, so you're having, this is kind of the milieu in which you're raised. And then it seems that you're a freshman in high school and this is where somehow the Catholic church kind of comes onto the scene. What tell, can you just briefly tell us a little bit about from going from this interdenominational, if you will, Protestant faith and upbringing at a young age, you know, 15, 14, 15 years old, how, how does Catholicism uh, uh, cross your path? Great question. So my, my mother was um, raised Catholic here in, here in Boston, mm-hmm. and she's from a good, good Italian family, of course, Catholic, but not necessarily very good Catholics growing up. Um, maybe, maybe less engaged with their faith when my mother was a girl. My, my grandmother at times in her life was extremely devout as, as a Catholic and she died a devout Catholic. Mm. But, um, I, I, there was a, the period when my mother was a little girl when they weren't really going to church on Sundays, but, but sending the kids off. So we, we had a Catholic background. My dad was always kind of a closet Catholic because he read history and patristics. And, um, that's, <laughs> I guess that's another reason why generally I, I would call it postmodern Christianity because, most of my friends who grew up evangelical think that uh, it went from the apostles to like Charles w- Charles Wesley or something in the you know like not Straight even line. like let's talk <laughs> yeah 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 there's um there's almost complete absent knowledge of anything that happened between 100 AD and uh, I, I would say even nowadays 1800 like yeah, there's yeah. a there's just a huge... the Reformation didn't really even kind of happen, you know. Yeah, I mean, the even the basic knowledge of, of the Reformation is, is really lacking these days, which is fine. But yeah. um, so uh, my dad, though, he was just a, a, his, a, a patristics nut. He loved reading the Church Fathers and philosophy, even, even Greek philosophy. Very well-read man, a uh, very wise man. And so both my parents were already kind of on their way, my, my, my mother on her way back home and my dad longing for the 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 richness and the deepness and the st- and the stability and the eucharist and the sacramental theology and everything mm. and then my sister lila was the first one to take the plunge in college uh she was um kind of witness to the faith by by opus day and opus day center at her school gotcha. and um she was received in the church and then like six months later we all were wow but well not we all we I have a huge family i say we all and i'm thinking about <laughs> Only my immediate brothers and sisters on in age, um, about half of us were. How many siblings <laughs> my, do you have, by the parents. way? How many how many siblings do you have? Yeah, there there are eight of us. Wow, that's yep, my wife's a family of eight. So I, I that's yeah, that's great. It's so a good it's, number. It's a good number. So um, we're gonna get more. We're gonna really focus this talk on the liturgy of the hours. But I want to ask you: Did you was there any um, praying of the divine office? Was there any familiarity of the with the liturgy of the hours? with your parents or in your upbringing? Did you get a sense of that? And I know we're going to get to a gift from your sister here in a few minutes, but, but to this point or shortly after you're, you're, you're entering the Catholic church or Catholic faith, did the liturgy of the hours, uh, was, was that on the radar at all? I would say that, um, for the first few years of being a Catholic, completely not on the radar. I mean, it wasn't even until like two years ago that I realized that priests are required to pray the Liturgy Mm -hmm. of the Hours under pain of mortal sin. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that priests make a solemn promise, uh, a vow even to to do that uh, is something that I, I was woefully ignorant of, yeah. but but rewinding to high school, I, I had no immediate introduction to the Liturgy of the Hours per se, and in our non-denominational Protestantism, we had nothing obviously like that. Some some Protestants have a Psalter, some mm-hmm. some denominations do um, a praying of the Psalms ritually, um, but not not our individualized church. And I think the reason why that is is 
I was reading um, Dom Guéranger, who is uh, one of my heroes. He's a servant of God. He'll be a blessed and a saint, I have no doubt. And if you haven't heard of him, I encourage you to look him up. But he um, was a French priest in the 19th century, and he writes that um, the the our Protestant brothers and sisters, uh, when they lost the Eucharist in um, after the Reformation, they also lost the Liturgy of the Hours mm. because the the two are inseparable. Both are part of the sacrifice of praise. And um, if you lose the Eucharist, you lose you lo- you lose the divine praises in the Psalms of the Liturgy of the Hours, mm. which is a really crazy thing to meditate on. And I'm still mulling over it. But uh, in college, uh, I started well in college years. I didn't go to college, but in uh, the college years, I started uh, praying with my uncle Frank remotely. Technology can be a wonderful thing. Yeah, and he called me yeah. from from Portland, Oregon, and said, "Hey, do you want to pray?" vespers every day for a year and i was only vaguely familiar with it from his introduction up to that point and i said absolutely so we would facetime each other every night for 365 days and we'd wow. sing vespers to each other and we only really ever sang it maybe occasionally recited but um and that was an impulse that i a gift i received from my uncle frank who is very musical but also very um prayerful and he understands the the unity of prayer and music so, 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 yeah. so is, is Uncle Frank Catholic? I, so, I, so is he praying oh, yeah. Vesper? Okay, oh, I, yeah. I mean, I figured he was, but sometimes there's a borrowing. Uh, a pro, some Protestants might borrow from the Catholic tradition and so on, and and then integrate it into their kind of life in that. And that, that, yeah, yeah, that that does happen. Yeah, in fact, so, everything they have is basically borrowed. But yeah, so, 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 my next question would be. When you're on the phone with Uncle Frank and he's said, "Let's pray, let's pray together," um, does he just start singing? And were you like, w- "What are you doing here? What's what is this?" Or d- did you were you familiar with the notion of something like vespers being sung? Is this your kind of your first exposure to the melding of vespers with with song, if you will? Yeah. Well, I I, I just there wasn't a zero to one where we yeah. I ever did vespers without singing because my real introduction was uncle frank and he just that's what he did um and i was comfortable with the idea of sung liturgy i think in large part because my my family would often go to the byzantine um rite and in in the byzantine rite um they sing everything everything Mm -hmm. that's prayed is sung um and so i i was very and my uncle frank also was just quite the quite the singer so it, it would it didn't strike me as wow well now we're doing something sung it would just get flowed what from frank, the uncle frank does yeah yeah well and not just what uncle frank does it made sense that this is what the church does yeah good yeah yeah okay yeah. i want to i want to move in for one second uh before we kind of move to our next segment um first of all let's just jog back to your work you and your brother just just for a little bit of a professional background what you're doing outside of what's going to become a bigger endeavor with Sing the Hours, you and your brother are are engaged for about a decade or so uh, in a in a business that you start up helping the youth, you know, public speaking, debate, debating yeah. and so on. I just want to I want to just segue for a second and say, how did you get into that? And and what what was what, what was your experience with that? Um, what have you taken from that? And I think you're still doing it, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so I, I mean, shout out to all of the parents who might listen to this <laughs> this episode, um, it's a really, really good idea to expose your kids to public speaking from a young age, especially through s- speech and debate, you know, uh, taking rhetoric classes if, if you can find them, um, being in speech club at school. I, I did speech and debate for like five, six years. My, my two loves in middle and high school were, were speech and debate and baseball. Mm. And uh, I ended up really... Um, specializing in in speech and debate, and it was it was life changing. It was a really good way, especially in this modern age when we're so plugged into <laughs> to technology yeah. and losing all that face to face time. Um, it it really helps to dedicate time specifically to the art of speaking and reasoning. And um, from there, my my brother and I started the um, the company we that that uh, exists today where where we work with school districts and schools to offer that sort of infrastructure that sort of curricula to to students and uh, it's great it's a, a very very good worthy endeavor um, 
my my brother's not involved with it anymore. He's he's now in finance, which is great. But sure. um, I, I still go to him for you know advice. Now actually, my sister <laughs> kind of runs the business. My younger sister, so it's Terrific. still it's still the the family, family business. business. But it's uh, we we uh, we've subbed out different siblings to keep it going. That's great. So let's move into the pandemic. Something happens in the pandemic, and, and you've described it as a quarter life crisis, if you will. Um, there was there was elements of of anxiety and depression in the midst of it, like many people have been afflicted by. What went wrong, and and how did the liturgy of the hours start to emerge as um, a relevant answer or or a balm, if you will, to uh, to what you were experiencing? Yeah. I really like the way that Bishop Barron talks about prayer. Um, what does he say? He says, I, I love to spend an hour a day being useless. Or mm. uh, how does he phrase it? Yeah. He says, um, just just doing nothing. And prayer is in terms of if, if, if we're just animal creatures, then prayer doesn't really make any sense. J- just like, you know, evolutionary biologists have a lot of trouble with music. Mm-hmm explaining music yeah. in our species. It doesn't really have any sort of genetic uh, markers. It doesn't really have any purpose that they can deduce. It's kind of useless. Um, but we're, we're not just natural creatures. We're also supernatural creatures. And therefore, music and prayer have maybe more meaning than, than anything else um, in, in, a, you know, in a different context, in our spiritual context. Yeah. So in the pandemic, I'm... Uh, I was counseled to combat the pandemic blues. I was counseled to try singing, but mm. specifically I had a, I had a, a Catholic mentor c- counselor and he said, um, try singing the liturgy, of the hours or the Psalms. If you've ever been familiar with them, I said, absolutely. So that's what I, I started doing. I started doing as many offices as I could, but I, I didn't really know what I was doing because the uncle Frank days involved kind of making it up as we went along in terms of what we sang. So if I'm going to approach, you know, a a psalm, if I was going to approach Psalm 80, we would sing something totally random like, Oh, shepherd of Israel, hear us. You who lead Joseph like a flock, enthroned on the cherubim, shine forth. And then he'd sing something and we'd kind of make up a tune. And it was all very, um, you know, like playing jazz, as, yeah, yeah. as you say. yeah. <laughs> but um, I was looking, I, I, as I was doing it more and more, I <laughs> had the, the I, I believe, an impulse of the Holy Spirit to, um, you know how the Holy Spirit, it says in Scripture, will teach us how to pray? Mm-hmm. I think the Holy Spirit teaches us how to sing, too, because yeah. the, the singing and the prayer are, are united. And for, for those of you listening and thinking, what do, what do we mean by the, the music and the prayer are united? The form of prayer is music. The form of prayer is song. Hmm. That's why the prayer book of our fathers in faith, the, uh, the, the Israelites, the, the Jewish people, the, the, their prayer book divinely inspired is and was the Psalms. The prayer book of all Christian quote unquote denominations that, um, claim a lineage from the apostles, all apostolic churches is the Psalms and the Psalms are explicitly music. So prayer of any Judeo-Christian people, the prayer of any Judeo-Christian people is musical. And if you go to a church, for those of you listening, um, there are 23 rites in the Catholic Church. And what a rite means is, for example, there are Ukrainian rite Catholics. There are Maronite rite Catholics who are totally, you know, the the, the Lebanese people, mm-hmm. but they're in communion with the Pope. Yeah. And they have their own, they don't celebrate the mass like we do. It's actually, the Lebanese rite is very similar, but they have a different way that they celebrate mass, liturgy, the hours, liturgy. And it's totally legitimate, it's totally ancient, and it's totally in its diversity still in communion with Rome. So why does that matter? It matters because if we stepped out of the Roman rite and we see what other churches who are totally in communion with us and have ancient tradition do when they sing, when they pray, they sing. If you went to a Greek rite, a Byzantine rite Catholic church, you would be shocked, number one, at how everything is completely and utterly sung. And number two, how easy it is to immediately jump into the ring and sing along. And this is what in the Roman rite, 
one of the main thrusts of the Second Vatican Council is, is that we need to rediscover. And, and actually, one thing people don't realize is technically one of the um, most important things I think that the Second Vatican Council did in terms of changing the liturgical framework is that it removed the distinction between a high mass where everything is sung and a mm. low mass mm. where everything is said. Now, that's that does not exist. There's nothing in the law that specifies, here's what you do when you just say things. Now, pretty much every part of our liturgical law says, uh, if possible, sing that. If yeah, possible, yeah. sing that. If possible, sing that. It wants us to sing more. Mm. Why? Because all of our other brothers and sisters sing. And, that, I mean, we don't do things in the Roman Rite because they're done in other rites, but the the important through line is that prayer is sung. Mm. So, the Holy Spirit, therefore, to circle all the way back, the yeah. Holy Spirit, therefore, will teach us to sing. And I felt the Holy Spirit, perhaps, I, I discerned maybe the Holy Spirit is responsible for this longing I have to sing this more properly, to sing it in a way that is you know, maybe designed by the Holy Spirit instead of just designed by my own wisdom, just singing in the kitchen. Now, if you are to try singing the Psalms, I encourage you as a starting place to do what I did and just sing it. it it'll flow from you. Mm-hmm. I think even in, in in a lack of awareness of the proper forms of singing it, any singing of it, I think, is 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 possibly better than just speaking these prayers and just reading them in, in your mind. I, it always drives me crazy when, uh, when I, uh, I talk to people who say, Oh yeah, the Psalms, I love the Psalms. I've been studying them recently. <laughs> study. <My dude. laughs> the Psalms are, the Psalms are great to study, study them. But if, if you are treating them like other scripture to be studied rather than to be prayed, mm-hmm. to be sung, mm-hmm. to be given to God as a sacrifice, the Psalms, when we pray them to God is a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. It's an unbloody On the altar of our heart, it is a sacrifice that's a response to the Eucharist, blah, blah, blah. The point is, um, in in that time, I said, where can I find online some instructions about how to pray this stuff? Where can I listen to it? Because I I love learning by ear. Mm -hmm. I I have very little musical training, but the musical training I do have, I'm I'm pretty good at picking something up. So I I went online and I typed in, you know, there's thousands of priests doing this, so surely they're going to give us some instructions. And there was very little, if any, sung liturgy of the hours available. So I mm. thought, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do it. And if, and if you want to join me, sing the hours. Those of you who are listening, the, 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 the place to find sung liturgy of the hours online is sing the hours. And I've been for the last three years posting twice a day the morning prayer and evening prayer office, and uh, it's it's been a, an, an incredible journey of, um, of, you know, building a global community of people who are being exposed to the sung Liturgy of the Hours. There's already, you know, millions of people who pray the Liturgy of the Hours, but unfortunately, and again, this is what the the Second Vatican Council sought to fix. Unfortunately, over, I would say, about 800 years, but with a few great ruptures that happened, um, the Liturgy of the Hours has become something that people do very, very quietly and um, isolated from each other, not as this public liturgy where everybody's, Rocking, rocking the praises yeah, of God yeah, together. Yeah. yeah. Sorry you, for the long answer. No, no, Todd. That, that was perfect and and, and very eloquent. I, two two things I want to raise. One is uh, it, it's it's interesting the way you talk about. Again, these are prayers. Uh, first of all, they're a sacrifice, and second of all, they're meant to be sung. Um, so we we ought to be doing this, and the experience can be di- can be different than like you said, reading in your mind or reading out loud. Um, it strikes me as this that what what I've been told by Shakespearean actors or scholars who have basically said. You know, to read Shakespeare is one thing, but it's designed as a play. It's designed to be viewed and watched and and experienced in 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 between living characters and so on. Uh, yes, you read Hamlet, but did you did you watch uh, and find yourself immersed in Hamlet on the stage? And all of a sudden, it's a it's a profoundly different experience. The second thing I, w- I wanted to actually ask you was, so so when you attend a mass and say it's a mass without without really. Uh, uh, there's the can there's a canter but beyond that canter or or maybe there's not even a canter it's a, it's a private mass or what have you let's say the music has not played a central role in that mass it's largely spoken throughout or chanted or what have you it's still the sacrifice of the mass there's still a profound holy experience that's 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 occurring but what is your personal experience when there's when it's devoid of music versus when it's flush with music what would you say about that personally 
first of all, for those listening, it's it's perfectly appropriate that Todd has um, switched over to discussing the Mass because the Mass and the Liturgy of the Hours are two expressions of the public liturgy of the church. The, the Liturgy of the Hours, some call it a continuation of the sacrifice of the Mass, which is appropriate. I think that might even be what the Catechism says. The, the Liturgy of the Hours, some people call it a response to what we receive in Mass. But the, the Liturgy of the Hours is something that priests do um, at minimum five times a day, every third hour of the day. Mm-hmm. And just, just to um, awaken in people, because as Todd asked me earlier, I was totally unaware as a young Catholic, even though I thought I knew everything as a convert, you know, when people become Catholic and they're teenagers and they think that uh, they have, they have a, a degree in moral theology. I, I loved defending the faith. I loved apologetics, but I never knew much at all about the Liturgy of the Hours, which is surprising when you learn how integral it is alongside the Mass to the life of the Church. A priest is required in canon law maybe to say one Mass a year. I thought growing up, I was scandalized. Um, I, I can remember being a teenager being scandalized when I heard a priest was taking a day off. And I thought, well, aren't you going to say Mass today? And I thought a priest had to say Mass every day. Mm. No, a priest has to say Mass once a year. But if a priest misses a single office of the Liturgy of the Hours without you know, just cause, then um, in the in the eyes of the church, they have broken a solemn promise. Mm. And what so... Five times a day, in order for a priest to live out his vocation, he has to stop what he's doing and pray the Psalms. One time a year, a priest has to say Mass. That doesn't necessarily mean anything about the importance thereof, but it, it does, it should be a wake-up call to any any of the faithful that this is something the church takes absolutely as serious as it does any other liturgy. With that being said, if we want to talk about the Mass and music, if I go to a private Mass, even if I'm not, quote-unquote, you know, um, the the beneficiary of it or the or running the show i will always say i'd love to canter and i will always mm. you know make sure the whole mass is sung all the four mass parts the antiphons everything sure um i rarely rarely have the experience maybe once or twice a year of going to a mass that is not sung because yeah. i i will just you know here i am yeah <laughs> here i am lord i have come to do your will <laughs> i i will always make sure e- even if i'm traveling if i'm traveling i will at the very least and I've and I've um, done this in cathedrals, um, where if I go to a daily mass and I'm in a, a random cathedral in a town that I'm I'm visiting, I will make sure to arrive 15 minutes early and I'll tell the sacristan I'm happy to sing the psalm. Yeah. If if you don't have somebody, they say, uh, yeah, we don't have somebody. You want to sing the psalm? Um, one time I was in Canada and uh, and he said I, I was at a, a major major shrine and the priest said, well. Um, where is she? I said, what do you mean she? And he said, well, uh, you like your wife, like she's, she's going to sing, right? I said, no, I, I, I'm happy to sing. And he said, you? I said, yeah. Cause like the thought of a young man volunteering himself <laughs> in church is like, and, 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 and it, it didn't even register. And I explicitly said to the priest when I walked up, I said, I'd be happy to sing the Psalm if you don't have a, a psalmist. And he literally without missing a beat said, well, where is she? Oh no! So, and then and then I said, uh, no, no, I I I can do it. I I'm a, a cantor. And he said, well, sing me something. He didn't believe me. He, he wanted me, so I just I just like broke into. You know, I just said, yeah. I said like you know, help us, oh God, our Savior, for the sake of the glory of your name. And after two lines, he said, okay, that's good, perfect, great, you're on. But then this is the crazy thing: is that it's so not. We have so much work to do that he then told the the, the lector. He said, this young man is going to be singing the psalm so she said oh the psalm so i just do the first reading he said yeah she said okay great she gets up there and after after the first reading she goes right into um you know the lord is my shepherd i shall not want and she had already done the response and the people had already started saying just without singing the lord is my shepherd but the priest um gestured for me to go up there i said no i mean it's already i'm not gonna like yeah. interrupt the liturgical act to, to have my little song it's not that it's not you know that important but no he like was very insistent so i went up there and i and i tapped her on the shoulder and she looked at me she goes oh <laughs> and then i restarted the lord is my shepherd i shall not want you know and it was just it was crazy oh, but anyway the, i i do that all the time so um and i would encourage if if you feel you know, you're, you're listening to this, this, uh, podcast and you're thinking, you know, I could probably learn to sing simple chant. Um, I encourage you to, to learn it and be that person because that's, that's, you know, being, being the change you want to see in the world, being the change the church wants to sing the world. Most people don't realize Todd that in the, in the general instruction of the lectionary, 
it says, whenever possible, the psalm, the responsorial psalm, should be sung. Mm -hmm. Again, no distinction between low mass and high mass. Like in the old rubrics, it would say, you know, low mass. You know, yeah, yeah. the psalm should be read quietly and said da da da. But in the in our worship, if it's a psalm, in all the documents, if it's a psalm, you sing it. And that's that's not like an ideal. That is in the law of our wow. current mass of, yeah. of the right. So, I, I mean, I take that seriously. And if you're listening and think I could do that, you don't need – this is – people's barriers are usually, well, I don't have the, the – um, my sheet music in front of me, or I don't have my guitar. I don't have my organ. I don't have my piano. Like people put a lot of different, but your human voice yeah. is what is filled with the spirit and you can do it. The, the, the Eastern Christians don't use any instruments ever. In fact, in their right, it's banned to use instruments. So you go into a, a Byzantine mass, like we talked about mm -hmm. a Greek, a Greek, uh, they, there's no instrumentation. They don't even like find pitch. They just do it. And mm. it's, it's, it's doable. It's yeah. totally, utterly, wonderfully beautifully doable to just sing prayer but by the way on that note i think i think that's such a good example also for people to see that you would step up and and the, the reaction of the priest i think we all know that reaction because that not 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 that he's expected it's got to be a woman or what have you but that he's surprised that someone stood up to say i would do this that I, that i yeah. i don't I'm, I'm just i'm 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 maybe new to this place, new to this mass, what have you, but I want to help. And here's how I can help. And all, all I have is my voice and let's go and do it. Um, and what a gift that is. And, and I, I would, I would also reason that that also, I'm sure helped to transform the mass to even it's a special place to be no matter what, but an extraordinary extra gift added um, by having brought the musicality to it and, and uh, that extra offering of prayer. So extraordinary. <laughs> Segment two, the Liturgy of the Hours. There's a great letter from church father and doctor St. Athanasius to Marcellinus, Paul Rose said, where he discusses the Psalms. It's not for our entertainment that we sing our Psalms. It's for the soul's own benefit. So, Paul, can you just, that, that particular um, quote jumped out at you. Can you explain a little bit about uh, what uh, St. Athanasius may, may be getting at when he says this? Yeah, so that's a great document from the fourth century, and it's crazy that he he writes one of the church fathers writes an entire document on the theology of music mm. in the Psalms, and I mean that shows you how seriously the early church takes music. He discusses in that document how the form of prayer is sung, and he even goes into psychology how. We don't get the full meaning. We don't get the full absorption, right? We don't even get the full healing unless it is sung. And he brings up King David in that document, um, which is so beautiful about how the uh, King, King David's being hunted by, by uh, Saul, right? Yeah. And um, Saul keeps having these murderous uh, thoughts about David and he wants to, he wants to just like m murder him uh, in, in the, in the, in the, what am I trying to say here? In the throne room, he just wants to go murder him. But then David plays, sings a psalm, and his singing, it says, drives the madness from wow. Saul. And so his weapon of defense and his weapon of healing also for uh, Saul is is to sing. <laughs> and oh, and I I think it's I think it's probably um, quite probable that he he just you know was singing a psalm. Uh, when he did that. But music has a spiritual dimension to it that is possible when you sing with the church. Uh, I, I think all music probably has a spiritual dimension to it in some way, but the but the real bread and butter is singing with the church, singing the church's music in, in the Liturgy of the Hours, in the Mass. Um, it's a beautiful thing, and it is for the soul's own profit because, I mean, you you look at those who had the courage to be Martyred. You look at the martyrs of Com Compiègne, the uh, the French. Uh, it was like what eighteen nuns yeah. more who who were um, who ended the French Revolution by by surrendering their heads. They uh, they were all beheaded, and as they were beheaded, every single one of them was singing liturgy. Or you look at Paul Paul Miki, who we're going to celebrate uh, this month, and uh, you know Saint Paul Miki um, 
first first of the of the Japanese martyrs. He he was on a death march for like four hundred plus miles, and the entire time he sung the liturgy of the hours, he sung the Te Deum, which is part of the mm. liturgy of the hours. And like the sacred music is uh, is the soundtrack of of the martyrs. This wow. this gives people courage. It um, there there is no no greater weapon that we have to to fight the good fight and also to save souls. The the music itself is um so spiritually powerful it can it can convert people on the spot it it does like you you look at um the uh the the russian barbarians uh in the what fifth sixth century were um like invading constantinople but but the the um the emperor of russia was converted on the spot along with his whole army from hearing the uh the chant in the Hagia Sophia. Like this is a tale as old as time that mm-hmm. it's not through eloquent preaching so often that people are converted. I mean, look at, look at those Japanese martyrs. When Paul Miki was being converted, do you think he was converted by some eloquent um, teaching in his own language? No, the language barrier was huge, but I, I'll, I'll bet you that Paul Miki was, was, uh, was, Prime was first brought the gospel. He they the the church leads with beauty, right? The church mm. brings its beauty, and that beauty is um almost always in the form of its sung prayer. Like the Catechism of the Catholic Church, believe it or not, it says, which is a crazy bold statement, it says that the the musical, the the the, the sacred music tradition of the church is an is the art form that surpasses all other art forms. Mm. So we have a declaration in the catechism that our chant tradition, which is what our sacred music is, is the most beautiful art ever made. Wow. It is the best. It is it is preeminent above. You know, I I was rendered speechless um, both times I saw Michelangelo's David mm-hmm. in Florence. Um, our music, our humble prayer, sung prayer, is even better. Amazing. Imagine all the people that the Pieta attracts. Imagine how many people go to the, you know, the Louvre in, in France and, you know, art brings people from far and wide to come see it. Our musical art in our prayer, if we would but humble ourselves to present it, to learn it, to do it, it brings people far and wide. And it also converts their souls. It saves their souls. So when, when, when we hear beauty will save the world and we hear lead with beauty, I mean, it's popping right off the page of the catechism. Yeah. It pops right out of the scriptures that the way we do that is sing the praises of God as the church has designed them to be sung. That is leading with beauty. That will heal the world. It's extraordinary. And um, the way you're characterizing it uh, as the church characterizes it, I was not aware of how uh, how overt the church was in declaring this in, in, in the pages of the catechism and so on. Um, it's extraordinary. The other thing I think we, we, you know, one of the things we can say about being human is yes, we can talk about um, the notion of being moved by great oratory. Yes. We can talk about the, the, but the, the, the notion of uh, being transformed by standing in front of exquisite art, <clears throat> but we all know uh, there's something kind of, that sets music apart. Uh, the lullaby sung by a mother, the the uh, the hymn that we are that we're offering up in in mass, um, the the this the soundtrack. I mean, I'm not trying to get go from the sacred to the secular, but even the soundtrack in a film that causes you to choke up. Yes, the drama of the story. Yes, the acting is extraordinary. But when that perfect note hits, that's when the lump comes in your throat. And it's it's as you said, I think originally. It's 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 almost ineffable. It's it's we it's 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 difficult to explain, other than to say this is something. This is a gift, and it's 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 not of my giving. It's a gift of God's giving. And so, as such, why would we not employ this gift and use this gift and and immerse ourselves in this gift in the highest and holiest moments of our engagement with our God? Yeah, yeah. You know? and 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 I was really struck a few years ago. A priest told me um, when I started volunteering to canter because I just knew my my personal journey is first the conviction that in prayer singing is necessary. Mm. 
which I, I got literally from a plain reading of the Second Vatican Council documents. It talks about, and from, from the general instruction of, of the uh, Roman Missal, which is our law and liturgy, blah, blah, blah. You read the church's documents, and it is so it is so plain, obvious, and simple, but also profound and beautiful. This this idea that we we must sing like it's part of it's part of being a Christian. It's part of our dignity as priest, prophet, and king. We gotta sing. But what uh, a priest shocked me by saying a few years ago because I started singing everything. He's like, "This is good. I like that you're you know singing these hymns or whatever, but you know you're just singing at mass." If you want to sing the Mass, then please sing these antiphons you'll find in the back of your pew missile. I said, antiphons? He said, yeah, the antiphons are part of the Mass, whereas what you're singing right now is just like, you know, you're it's good, but you're you're singing a soundtrack to Mass. You're not singing mm-hmm. the Mass, mm-hmm. which I was like, what? And I, I mean, if you're on this podcast thinking, what is he talking about? He just used the word antiphon. Um, go do some uh, Googling of antiphons, Mass antiphons. The antiphons are the official music of the Mass, of, of our current Mass too. Like some people think, is that just an old Mass thing before Vatican Council? No. More than ever, we have antiphons, which are the the entrance chant, the entrance music, mm-hmm. the offertory music, the communion music. And these we usually hear just hymns. Those hymns are like this priest told me, and it turns out it's true. That's singing at Mass, mm-hmm. which is fine but not ideal. The ideal is to sing the Mass as a prayer, a unified prayer. And when we do the chants, we sing the Mass. And I realized in that moment, I was given this grace. Every Mass I've ever been to since then, I hear clearly, especially as I've familiarized myself with the antiphons. The antiphons are are the official prayers that that the church chants at the Mass. Mm-hmm. When I when I hear the when I hear like just a random hymn being sung, I actually can hear louder in my in my spirit's ear. In my mind's eye, I can hear louder the angels and saints singing the proper wow. chant. Wow. And if if it's just a, a spoken mass, if there's no music, Todd, I got to tell you, I hear like a symphony of sound. All the angels and saints in my mind's ear, I hear them all singing the antiphons. Wow. Every mass, whether we like it or not, has, because what the church binds on earth is bound in heaven. And, you know, my, my personal opinion is, that every mass has the full bells and whistles, all of the music. But if it's not sung by us, it's sung by the angels in heaven. And mm-hmm. when we do the mass properly and the liturgy of the hours, and when we sing it, we are uniting our <laughs> actual song with the song that is happening in the halls of heaven. Incredible. And that language is from the Second Vatican Council. It says um, in, in, in the document, in Sacrosanctum Concilium, it says... Um, Christ has introduced into our earthly exile that hymn, which is sung throughout all ages in the halls of heaven. So right there we have, there's singing going on forever in heaven. And what liturgy is, the reason why all the churches sing, liturgy is a uniting our song on earth, our pilgrim song, with the heavenly song in the church triumphant. And that's something you only get in the Catholic church. You get this idea of the church triumphant, suffering, and militant all being one. Mm. There's this oneness. People don't just disappear when they die. They continue in the body. And that that um, language is so important when it comes to music because it, it can give me the certainty that even if we don't get in my lifetime to the place where we're singing everything <laughs> in liturgy, like, yeah. like I dream about, yeah. Um, the battle's already won. We're already doing that in heaven. And if 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 I can't be a part of accomplishing that on earth, I know the moment I die will already, I mean, I will just be able to sing, sing with the saints in heaven. If, and if I'm not ready to sing with the saints in heaven, because my voice hasn't been tuned yet, my um, my singing, then uh, I, you know, I'll spend a little more time in purgatory myself to get some singing lessons. It's incredible. It's incredible. I, Paul, let's, let's, we've been talking a lot about the liturgy of the hours. Could you just say a few words for those who are uninitiated about the structure of the liturgy of the hours? What is that? So what does that look like? We'll talk in a, in the next segment about how you cover two of the offices on sing the hours, Yeah. but, but, but what, let's talk about what a person can do or a priest is, is required to do. What does the structure of the liturgy hours look like? That's a great question. And that's, that's such a, yeah, that's I, I, I sh- we should have gone over that first. Um, for those uh, we, had, we wanted to build we it said, up, we wanted to build yeah, it up. No, this is good. This is so good. Yeah. So, so 
For those of you who have been hearing the phrase liturgy of the hours a lot, this is um, a great observation that we should we should discuss the structure. So the liturgy of the hours follows the Psalms, which you may have deduced already. And the Psalms are King David's, uh, you know, Holy Spirit inspired prayer book in the Old Testament that the church still uses today as its prayer book. The Psalms, the church takes so seriously living them out and praying them to, to, to unite its mind with the mind of Christ that it requires its clergy, priests and deacons, to do this liturgy of the hours, which is a, a methodical cycle of praying through all the psalms. If you are in a monastery, you will do this all the time. For, for those of you who might have never given a, a second thought to what do monks and nuns do? Hmm. Monks and nuns have discerned that they want to, in, in, its, in its most basic sense, a monk... Um, or a nun prays the liturgy of the hours in common in a monastery constantly, basically, like four hours a day, you might say, with their brothers and sisters. And that is something that they they make a uh, you know a promise to do and they do it in community and they do it for the rest of their lives until they graduate to heaven where they'll continue to do it. The praises of God don't cease <laughs> on earth. Yeah. So the liturgy of the hours is, the, the, the praying of the Psalms, it's the praise that the church renders to God. The debt of praise is the way it's described. We owe God our praise. We owe him the Psalms. We owe him his, his glorification. And that's so prevalent in the scriptures, you know, um, come let us sing to the Lord and shout with joy to the rock who saves us, Psalm 95, right? Mm. Let us sing to him because he has saved us, right? For he is our God. We are his people, the flock he shepherds. It is the duty of the flock to sing to God. And the church takes that seriously in, in, in requiring its priests and its religious to sing the Liturgy of the Hours or to pray the Liturgy of the Hours. It is a month cycle in the current church, in, in the current uh, law. It is a month-long cycle. So every 30 days, you will basically pray through, give or take, the 150 Psalms and a lot of other scriptures. It's divided into a morning prayer office, which we do on our podcast, Sing the Hours, three daytime prayer offices, which a priest could do um, in the current law in, in just one session. So if a priest can't pray at 9 a.m., 9 noon, and 3 p.m., the church allows the priest to combine all three of those shorter offices into one. And so let's say a typical priest might wake up, do morning prayer at like 8 a.m. or whatever. And then at noon, perhaps a priest might do their daytime prayer office, which is really three collapsed into one. And then at 6 p.m., evening prayer generally begins, although it doesn't have to be exactly at 6. It just has to be in the evening. A priest and, um, and the church will do its evening prayer psalms. And then there's Compline, and Compline is your completorium. It completes the cycle, it completes the day, and you do that right before you go to sleep. It's night prayer. There's one more office we're missing. You might be thinking, well, that's morning prayer, daytime prayer, evening prayer, and Compline. That's only four. I thought the minimum is five, and the minimum is five because there's also the office of readings, which is a floating office, which used to be attached to the 5 a.m. sunrise hour. You do it before morning prayer. But now it is a floating office. You can do it at any hour. You could do it at 2 p.m., you know, because priests are very busy or yeah. they should be very busy. And um, the Office of Readings is a pastoral allowance of the Second Vatican Council, where now in the Liturgy of the Hours we have this, <laughs> this Swiss Army knife, knife office that can be done anytime. So that's the basic structure. But the goal is as it says in the scripture, from the rising of the sun to its setting, may the name of the Lord be praised. The Liturgy of the Hours is the Christian fulfillment of that of that wish in scripture, um, of this prevalent idea that we owe God our praise, and at the very least, we need a whole class of people, that's our priesthood, that um, make sure, no matter what, as a solemn vow, make sure that that happens. But, in the general priesthood of all the baptized, we are all invited mm. to participate in that priestly work of 
interceding for the world and praising the Lord in, in, in the liturgy of the hours. And um, though we are not required as lay people, Todd, you and I, we are strongly encouraged to participate in the liturgy of the hours. And um, I love, again, Dom Gouranger, like, like, I, like I mentioned at the beginning, that, that wonderful Frenchman in the 19th century. He says the first, quote unquote, sad revolution of Christianity was that lay people stop singing the Psalms. Wow. He identifies that as the, as the harbinger of decline in the faith. What has caused in his mind, and he's writing this in the 1830s, mm. in his mind, what caused the first great rupture with the past, the first great dissolution of, of piety, sensibility, was when the faithful, us, stopped singing the Psalms to, to, to God and participating in this beautiful, beautiful um, work of the church. And um, I... I I see that now. I see that Dom, Dom Grunje is correct that we, it is a an aberration, in, in, in aberration from ancient practice that we do not, as faithful Catholics, regularly join our priests in singing the Liturgy of the Hours. Liturgy, if you might be wondering, so the Mass is liturgy, liturgy is liturgy, <laughs> the, the Liturgy yeah. of the Hours. Liturgy is work for the people. It's public in nature, and it's the entire church's um, voice or act, like when you do a liturgical blessing, quote unquote, that means the entire church is being represented in that blessing. When you mm. do a baptism, the whole church in Christ, Christ's body, is there in that baptismal liturgy. So when we do the liturgy of the hours, we are truly praying with the church. We are praying in the church's voice. And that's something that ideally should be public priests in times of yore would do uh, in in terms of what what I've studied and seen it's it seems that the norm would be to do that fully with the laity all the time um, there are councils in a thousand years ago that talk about how a priest will be cut off from his beneficence from his um sorry from his uh I think that might actually be the word from his income a priest will be cut off from his income mm -hmm. if he does if he fails to publicly sing the psalm so there's councils that say you need to stop doing it privately even a thousand years ago right wow. you have to do it with people like it has to be a public act where you're all together singing but nowadays like i said when i was i i, I totally forgive any ignorance because when i <laughs> for a, a decade of being catholic i didn't know priests were even required to do this i didn't yeah. even understand the prevalence of this in our in our church's um laws and our church's like lifestyle in terms of living the, the liturgical year it's so beautiful it's so wonderful and you're totally able as a lay person to do it which is so awesome because like i can't do a baptism willy-nilly yeah i can't confect the eucharist i can't bring christ to people in the body and blood of christ in a mass mm -hmm. i'm just a layman but i can do liturgy fully without a priest when i do the liturgy of the hours that's explicit so if you are a lay person you have so many riches to tap into of being priest, prophet, and king. You're baptized priest, prophet, and king. You can exercise that fully by doing the Liturgy of the Hours in your family life. Be, be young men out there. Let's stop shocking priests by volunteering at Mass to sing. And they think, oh, surely that's, the, that's a woman's job. Young men can step to the plate, be the priest of your household. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? The domestic church. You be, you be a priest. And you sing to your children, lead them in the liturgy of the hours, lead them in song. That is a beautiful vision of Christendom. And that is, I believe, a restoration that Dom Grunjay longed for, that I long for, that the church longs for. Extraordinary. There's an archbishop that that is has passed um, out of Minneapolis, St. Paul Diocese, <clears throat> who we, I've been told when he was counseling priests that were having troubles the first thing you would ask them is, when did you stop praying? And 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 it's interesting because I think the modern mind, uh, especially a modern mind dislocated from the faith, looks at the, I would presume, the liturgy of the hours for priests, but especially for lay people, as being, at best, some sort of time-consuming, meditative, contemplative, 
process that sort of calms the person down. That's sort of a, I mean, they, they kind of sort of, they bring this out to being sort of a, a pop, a little bit of a pop psychology, you know, kind of your, this is your kind of mantra or what have you that you're, you're kind of immersing yourself in and therefore your blood pressure is going down, your heart rate's going down and you're at, you're at ease and so on and so forth. Now, it doesn't mean to my experience and to my way of thinking, it doesn't mean that you can't have extraordinary peace and find a place uh, of contemplation. It, we, you, of those, those are wonderful aspects of what I think comes, can come out of the liturgy of the hours, but this is actually a profound devotion to God. It is a, it is a connectedness with the divine. Um, it is a plugging into the otherworldly in the best of ways. And, and to your point also, the, the, what the world calls useless, um, we as Catholics call utterly indispensable. Um, and so, uh, so that leads into my next question, which is, we we live in a world of absolute and utter distraction, of breakneck efficiency, of of um, ceaseless pleasure seeking. Um, is there? How do you convince a world with all of those variables kind of ass assailing them? Uh, to take the time to pray the liturgy of the hours? It's a good question. I think you hit the nail on the head that we, we look for the usefulness of everything as a culture. We we try to make some sort of psychological use out of explaining why priests would do this. Mm -hmm. Why why would somebody just spend... Because, I mean, it takes... If you sing the whole thing, and I often do, if I sing all the liturgies of of, of, of the day, it'll take me about an hour so it's an, it's a solid hour in just singing to what in the eyes of the world is a fictitious fairy tale deity that may yeah. or may not exist and that doesn't necessarily like um or the way the scripture says it you um even though you haven't seen him you love him says says the epistle which i mm -hmm. love um yeah we haven't seen the risen lord in in his full 10 fingers 10 toes fleshly self we see him and receive him in the eucharist fleshly but not but through a veil right there's the blah, blah, blah. But, but it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, there isn't sometimes no usefulness of it. And sometimes it can be extraordinarily comforting. Like the amount of healing that, that I've seen received at a, um, like when, when my, my grandmother died, when we did the offices of the dead for her, there's liturgies of the hours for the dead. When we sang the requiem eternum, you know the 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 requiem mass with its proper prayers yeah so healing the music can be such a balm it can be such a transformative healing experience but it also can be completely rote and there's no um <laughs> there's no benefit whatsoever hmm. you could feel nothing paul Miki wasn't like having his nice meditation when he was in in, in a death march yeah. and singing the Te Deum. He was yeah. receiving no benefit from it. The, the the martyrs of Compiègne were not benefiting as their heads rolled on the floor and they were still gasping out their 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 last notes from their severed heads. That's not beneficial psychologically. It's praise. Yeah. It's 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 a clarion call. It it's a battle cry. It is and it doesn't necessarily have any noticeable like Christ when he's saying when he's saying from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he's saying from the cross, Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. When he's saying these things, which are Psalms, um, they the people passing by tried to make sense of it. They tried to find some use. They were like, oh, he's calling Elijah. Yeah. They, 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 they could not even understand that Christ was doing to his very last. He was doing what he came to do, which is the will of his father. To the very last breath, Christ was singing the eternal praises of the Trinity, which he's, which he's part of. Like, this is, it, it transcends use. It transcends meaning. Um it it's it's something you could think of eternally and the, the way you get people to want to do it is you do it mm -hmm. the way you get people to see the um the power and see see heaven open up inside of it is to make it visible yeah. when 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 we just read the liturgy of the hours as some devotional material when we just do a said mass it's like a light under a bushel i see mm -hmm. those angels and saints singing it in heaven and it's like we're turning the volume off on the most beautiful thing ever. It's like it's like turning the soundtrack off. It's like in in your in your movie, like you said. It's like 
let's let's mute the most essential yeah. part that's that's capable of moving mountains and moving souls and mm. inspiring people let's just mute it and um we'll we'll you know because the the grace is there like and it's true you you could say that the eucharistic grace is always there but the eucharistic grace without water like christ does give sow his seed everywhere like in the mm. parable right the the but it's not a surefire victory without all the other graces that that Christ has given as a follow up which which need to be all very carefully received in order to water the eucharist which is you know which is freely given but yeah i mean if if, if we want to bring people like i've seen it's so sad when you bring someone to mass who's not catholic oh my gosh the mass is obviously something that is exclusive mm. it excludes the mass is like, oh, by the way, make sure you don't receive the Eucharist. And you know, we when whenever I've brought friends to mass, it's it's this always hostage situation of like, should I tell him? Is he just gonna know not to go up there and receive, or do I need to explicitly? And now it's this awkward conversation where it's like, yeah, I brought you here to include you, but now I don't want you to take part in the most essential part. Um, that that actually, I've seen that cause scandal to people. You know, it's never exclusive. Hmm. Liturgy of the hours. I've invited. Yeah. So many people, my atheist friends, I've prayed it with Muslim friends. I've prayed it with atheists, Jew, Jewish friends. We had a party Easter Monday, um, uh, Jewish uh, young man. He sang all the Psalms with us. Like, it's just, it's completely, there's no barrier to entry. And it's that's why in times of yore, it is the primary evangelistic tool of the church. When When the... Like Pope Pope uh, Pope Pius XI talks about in a in a um, apostolic letter in 1929, he's like, the chant of the church has converted for thousands of years all the pagans to Christianity. He he specifically says it's the sacred music, and he says it's vespers. He talks about how churches again. This is like a hundred year project of the church. We are desperate. All the popes are desperate to have people praying vespers again, which is mm-hmm. evening prayer, and uh, he says all of the all of the pagans like and if you think about it like think about in europe when the gospel was spread there all those pagan tribes they all had crazy music they had crazy you know drum like every culture has music and all of them were converted by we we didn't like try to adapt it's not like there's like you know 20 different styles of music that the church has from the medieval period no the one style of the church's chant gregorian chant converted thousands of different peoples that all had totally different languages Mm. and totally different music and it's the greatest art ever like the catechism says and it's so capable of being received by every different type of culture the enculturation of music is gregorian chant it is Mm. it's not like we need to adapt it to various usages in you know oh well we need to figure out what's really going to connect to you know Californians or Massachusetts people or whatever. No, it's like every culture, every culture is convertible through chant, period. That's what all of history shows us. And we don't need to like try and make it in our own image to make it palatable because it's not about its palatability. It's about its power. The chant itself is a weapon mm. that, um, and, and that's what, that's what Pope Paul the 12th, uh, Pope Pius the 12th says in uh, the last century is that the, the, the psalm, psalms themselves are a weapon that conquers everything. It conquers sin. It conquers um, uh, doubt. It, it's it's the most beautiful thing ever. Like you, you can't convince somebody by reading them the text of a Tinder profile to date somebody. You can't be like, yeah. here's here's the text of an online dating profile. Doesn't this person sound great? What does every person in the universe always say? Well, let me see a picture. Yeah. Nobody yeah. who's ever been on a dating app is going to be like, I will go on a blind date with this person because you've read me their bio. Nobody in history <laughs> will do that. But every person is like, where is, okay, I need, I need the beauty to draw me. Yeah. Show me the beauty, yeah. right? Yeah. And I don't know what planet we live on if we're going to try to evangelize people by these like silent red masses and just think they're going to be blown away or something. It's just, it defies all reasonable anthropology or or experience the the spiritual realm doesn't um attract you in you know in spite of no beauty the spiritual realm attracts us because it is 
infinitely more beautiful than that online dating profile. Yeah. The mass, when it's when when we actually turn the volume up and sing the mass, the liturgy of the hours, when we turn the volume up and sing it and make it audible to people, is the most beautiful thing that the world could ever see, period. It's not that, you know, this is some like frill where we're going to like polish it up and make it sound nice or it's not like we just trust blindly in well the eucharist will attract people yes the eucharist will attract people but it will also confuse people and drive them away on its own christ Mm -hmm. himself was like you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood and um i mean the the early church fathers talk about it as the awful mystery it's it's terrifying Mm -hmm. it you know it's like not to mention it's exclusionary at, at it as a sales pitch because we have to tell people don't do this or you'll yeah, die. Yeah. Like they, they all abandoned Christ for that. He had like 72 apostles. Christ was like, my stats are really good. And then two minutes later, he has 12 left. Yeah. The ratio of success in terms of attractiveness of just the Eucharist as an evangelistic tool are from, from the very first proclamation of it by Christ to now are very low. Mm-hmm. That's why the church never used it as an evangelistic tool. It concealed it and it put it behind the the rude screen or the iconostasis or the curtain. And it said, this is something you can hear about later. But for now, let's chant. Yeah. The, the, the outward facing profile of the church is our sacred music. That's mm-hmm. the outward facing dating profile and by design. And instead we flipped it around and we, in many places, don't do that. We don't show people the the best thing we got in terms of beauty. Hi, I'm Todd Warner, Managing Editor of Evangelization and Culture, the Journal of the Word on Fire Institute. Word on Fire is a global evangelical community that exists to provide our members with the resources they need to proclaim Christ to a secular culture. Our award-winning quarterly journal, Evangelization and Culture, is offered exclusively to Word on Fire Institute members. It's a tangible representation of our mission and goal to lead with beauty in order to bring others to the knowledge of truth. Inside each issue, you'll find writing from premier scholars and inspiring pieces on literature, culture, and daily life from fellow missionaries on the journey to know and serve Christ. Get a copy of the current issue of the Evangelization and Culture Journal for free by visiting wordonfire.org slash journal. Thank you and join us in bringing Christ to a hungry culture. Segment three, Sing the Hours. Reflecting on Sing the Hours, Paul Rose observed, Prayer is the life of the church, and I want to encourage the church to use her singing voice in prayer. This isn't a new idea. Music has been at the heart of worship for millennia, from the ancient Psalms of David to the great Gregorian melodies of medieval monasteries. The church provides us with a heavenly tool for daily prayer in the Liturgy of the Hours. This beautiful liturgy or divine office is in its very nature designed to be sung. Yet singing the office has nearly vanished in modern parish life and prayer. Perhaps many of us think of singing as a secular pursuit or a job for experts only or an optional ornamentation to the real business of worship. But with Sing the Hours, we aspire to help everyone, clergy and laity alike, practice and enjoy and enjoy the daily rhythm of sung worship just as this liturgy was intended. So. Paul, obviously, you've been giving us this incredible, um, incredible affection for and devotion to the Liturgy of the Hours, and also a, a, a clear appreciation, which which is evidenced by the deep, deep reading and also the the deep investment you have um, in singing singing the Hours. Um, how how have you been thus far transformed from? sitting with uncle Frank uh, on the, on the, on zoom for 365 days in a year from stepping away from um, a a Catholic therapist who said, you know, you ought to, you ought to sing this. How have you been transformed from those solitary and yet communion with heaven moments to where you are now um, with this widespread platform podcast, YouTube channel where twice daily, every day, in English and in Latin, you you sing the hours to a large and vast audience. How do we go from point one to point two here? It's a great question. So the church is a body. Bodies have DNA code. The DNA code of the body, the church, is the various 
councils, law, scripture, what is written, right? And I love that we have a unique, I, I think people don't understand the gift to the world that the, the, the Judeo-Christian worldview brings in terms of we really care about what is written. Christ says it is written, it is written, and it's like that's the, Christ says every jot of the law, right? He comes to fulfill every single jot. And that hasn't disappeared in post-Christ. It's even more important than ever now because now we have the grace, the tools to actually fulfill what is written because Christ gives us grace to actually be holy and to and to do that. So the place, the, the way that I've, and what I'm still on the journey of with Sing the Hours is I just want the authentic body of the church, the DNA, to be visible by going to what is written and presenting it. And what is written is... Um, all kinds of profoundly beautiful and simple liturgical prescriptions in the Liturgy of the Hours, in the Mass. And when we do those, it's like fireworks, magic happens. And so what does this mean practically? It means, yes, pray with what is written in the church, in the Liturgy of the Hours. Instead of, people have a hard time praying. Prayer is hard. Like, Mm -hmm. how do I know if what I'm praying is a proper sacrifice to God? How how do I know this is going to be acceptable? Is this the right thing to pray? Am I just supposed to talk to God like a friend? The Liturgy of the Hours is the greatest single way to pray because it's you're uniting your voice with the authentic DNA, you know? Mm. You're you're uni- you're uniting it with everybody else in one body. Christ doesn't teach us to pray, my Father, who art in heaven. Yeah. Christ doesn't teach us to pray, give me this day my daily bread. That's talking to a friend. That's talking to a one-on-one. That's a personal relationship. That's not what Christ wants. Christ wants a corporate relationship. He wants us to pray our Father. And I, I don't mean that absolutely. Being Having a personal love for yeah. Christ, necessary. Having yeah. a personal baptism where Christ personally um, makes you his own, a personal brother, necessary, necessary, necessary. But having a personal meaning exclusive, meaning it's just um, it's uh, individual, mm-hmm. that's not really scriptural. What's scriptural is our Father us this day two or more are gathered in my name than i am among you and that's what that's what you get in the liturgy hour so if if you've ever had doubt like am i praying how do i pray if you want to learn how to pray pray with the church the liturgy Mm -hmm. of the hours and so sing the hours has been a journey towards trying to figure out exactly how the church wants it to be done that's my mission Mm -hmm. because the liturgy hours is done beautifully by all faithful priests, by deacons, by monks, by nuns, by many lay people. You can order the the Word on Fire book. I have it right here. Mm-hmm. Um, they have their orange books that you can subscribe to. And then you can get Lods, Vespers, and Compline. So you, if if you're not a theologian or a scholar and you just need the text, um, Word on Fire has a great resource in its, in, its, in its booklets. Sing the Hours, of course. You can listen to it sung. But what, what I want to do differently with Sing the Hours and what, what we've done is we've taken the the just you know the text that is written, but then we've done the crazy Gandalf work if you're if you're familiar with Lord of the Rings, to go to the library in Minas Tirith and try to figure out what does the church want this to sound like? Because mm-hmm. there's more than than just meets the eye um, in terms of what is written. The church has deep lore, deep tradition that is unbroken and beautiful in terms of what this is supposed to sound like when you sing it. And that is where Sing the Hours can help you because we only sing according to the chant tradition. We only sing the the Gregorian forms. And, the, and when you sing with Sing the Hours, you're not just singing the text along with the whole church today. You're singing it with the same tunes that the whole church of yesterday has always sung it with. So you're uniting your voice, not just in terms of its, um, of its content, but even of its quality, the sound of your voice is truly united with the saints of the past and the future when you use the church's musical language, which is called Gregorian chant. Or if you're in another faith tradition, um, Byzantine chant is also beautiful. You have um, you have three or four major chant traditions. Ambrosian chant is, at this point, to the modern ear, will be pretty much indistinguishable from Gregorian. But speaking of Ambrose, I'll, I'll, I'll end... Uh, this little reflection with this. I love when when Ambrose of Milan, the guy who taught Augustine, 
mm-hmm. you know, the fourth century titan of the faith, the amazing church father. When Ambrose talks about the psalm, this is what he says. He says, the psalm is a blessing for the people. It is the praise of God, the tribute of the nation, the common language and acclamation of all. It is the voice of the church, the harmonious confession of faith, signifying deep attachment to authority. It is the joy of freedom, the expression of happiness, the echo of bliss. Oh. Ambrose, preach. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. You know, let me ask you this, Paul. So uh, nuts and bolts for one second. You said, you said again, th- this, is, this is rooted in, obviously, the deep lore, the deep tradition, and, and, and the Gregorian chant. Is there, liter- is there literally a sheet music for each one of these um, offices? I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, are you finding, are you, are you designing your, the tunes of your, of your, you know, singing of this? Are you designing that yourself? Are you writing the music yourself? Or are you literally tapping into this ancient music that's been written and bringing it anew to each one of these? I just didn't know how that worked. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm still, I'm still day by day discovering how it works. <laughs> it's a, uh, but you know, what's beautiful when we talk about how the modern culture is obsessed with use Liturgy means work, right? Mm -hmm. When we do liturgy, dude, it's hard work. Like, think about God, especially because he's given us so much. Like, he's worthy of our our meditating on his law day and night, as the scripture says. He's worthy of our sacrifice of praise. He's worthy of our labor to make it better and better. Like, we give God the best. And so the fact that it's difficult to look up all this music and to, like— get all the get yeah. everything straight that's okay yeah. it's okay because it's also something that you do every day like it's difficult to deadlift 500 pounds and you won't get there on day one you'll get there after years of doing it daily yeah. which is why it's okay if the sacrifice of praise isn't totally polished yet the the diamonds in there and it might yeah. this book if, if you order the word on fire book the liturgy of the hours you might at first not feel anything. It might just feel like, well, this is so procedural. Dude, getting good at anything is procedural. Yeah. And it's worshiping is what we want to get the best at. The best at. Yeah. It's it's a more worthy goal. And the more worthier the goal, like when I when I wooed my wife, it wasn't easy. Mm-hmm. It didn't just like right from the beginning, like like happen like clockwork. We had to go through, you know, our ups and downs and I had to work at it. I had to, and you know, we still have to work at our marriage. Like is a marriage not authentic or real because it's not easy? No, a marriage is more beautiful when you got to work some stuff out. Like my yeah. sister Lila on a, on a podcast, I think uh, today, or you, you can go look up her podcast too. It's awesome. The, the, the Lila Rose podcast. Um, She was talking about how like so many people divorce because they don't feel it anymore or because it's, you know, it's, I, I, uh, I'm not attracted to my wife anymore. Like our r- relationship with God can be like that too. And the liturgy of the hours, the music of it can be work. It can be hard, but that's okay. Is yeah. the first <laughs> disclaimer. Now, in terms of what we do, um, you can successfully do a Psalm in the mind of the church by doing any of the Psalm tones. That's the, that's the easiest part and the most applicable part. So a Psalm tone is eight different like um, tune uh, structures that mm-hmm. the church applies to psalms when they recite them in the Liturgy of the Hours. And psalm tones might sound like this. I'll just do a really quick demo, and you can yeah, listen please. to Sing the Hours to hear more. <clears throat> so if I'm doing the Magnificat, Mary's prayer, which the church prays every evening, I could sing, He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. This is tone eight. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. So so every two lines, there's this little thing it does in a psalm tone where in the first line, it'll always have the same structure. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. That's tone eight. Mm -hmm. The second half of the line always goes da, 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 da. So whatever Mm -hmm. syllables line up with it for those endings, that's how it sounds. But then there's also like Psalm tone one, which sounds like this. 
He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. It'll take you a while to learn psalm tones. If you listen mm. to Sing the Hours, you'll go much faster because I'm I'm doing them twice a day. It'll, it's 40 minutes of psalm tone exposure. But that little tune, da, 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 da. Mm-hmm, so I could mm-hmm. talk to Todd and I can say this. And then we can talk about Pope Pius X. And I can sing in tone one anytime. Mm. And it always has the same structure. At the beginning of a line, it always sounds like that. And then at the end of the line, it always sounds like this. And so that's tone one. And you can you can apply it to any scripture, any psalm. And it always sounds the same in every couplet of lines. Or if there are triplets, there's rules for that too. But that's that's the simplest way to demonstrate it, is that yeah. the church has eight vibes, eight genres, basically. Mm. Those are the eight psalm modes, and these tones are little tunes that happen. And actually, those modes, the best way to think about it is it's minor and major key, but way more options. You know, minor key is kind of sad. Like if I was singing like, it's too late to apologize, that song yeah, by One yeah, Republic, that's yeah, minor key. Yeah. Or... um you know, then then we have major key songs which are happy, like uh, Uptown Funk, go and give it to you, or whatever. <laughs> like like you, we we have major happy, minor sad is how most yeah, modern yeah. music is. In the Gregorian modes, there's not just major minor. There's um, there's eight options, and they have different. Some of them are sad, yes, they sound minor. Some of them are happy, but then there's all kinds of different little variations too. Like this is the modus angelicus. This is our angelic sound. It's not mm. just happy sad. We have angelic. We have uh, su- su- uh, sublimus, the sublime tone, and they're and they and they're meant to correspond to different vibes of prayer. But you can apply any psalm tone to any psalm. I firmly believe that, and it brings out different qualities. Like if I were to sing the Magnificat, in that the first one was sub- sublimus, the he has cast down the mighty from their thrones, and has lifted up the lowly. That sounds like I'm on an ascent to heaven. Like mm-hmm. it's like I'm at total peace. The victory is won, and it's just like we're crowd surfing with the angels. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. But then the first one, um, modus gravis, the the grave, the set, the like serious would be the he has cast down the mighty from their thrones, and has lifted up the lowly. This is like I'm in. I'm I'm escaping my enemies. I'm King David. I'm hiding in the cave, and I'm just like, I'm down to business. I'm preparing yeah, to fight. Yeah, it's grave. Yeah. It's very solemn. Um, yeah. So like they they all there's there's six more of them. Like you know they then they all have a different uh, different vibe. You could say to use some modern speech, and that's really cool. And the church has always had those. Ambrose had four modes, but Gregory added four more in the ancient church. And since then, we've been off to the races. We've had eight ever since. Eight modes, and or moods. Yeah. So do you? But then there's so much more complexity than that. But that's just like that is that is the starting point is understanding that uh, the the church's genre of chant has at its as its foundation it has these modes, and that's the starting point. The modes have little tunes or tones that uh, that uh, occur within them, and then there's chant books from the entire history of the church, and those chant books will assign. Um, antiphons which for me is the complicated part that's where i can't really explain it it's like the there are antiphon tones tunes you can find and they all happen in different modes and um there are current books that the church still releases like the 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 church released its most recent collection of antiphons in 2020 you got to buy the antiphonale romanum and that's all the the like the specific tunes of the things you pray before and after the psalm it's very complicated but it's worth it and if you want the fruits of the labor of the yeah. thousands of hours I spend doing this, just listen to Sing the Hours. And um, if if you want to do it yourself, I would just look up a couple psalm tones and just sing everything to those tones. And now you're doing chant and it's fine. There are no rules really about what you sing with what. So you can just tack psalm uh, tone eight on anything. Um, maybe I'll make an explainer video on on our new channel, Chants and Rants, where we go where where, where we break down exactly how to sing one or two psalm tones. Then then you can get started that way. But if you want to sing with the voice of the church, the simplest way to do it is um, 
either listen to Sing the Hours or on your own, start singing a couple simple psalm tones. Look up Psalm Tone 2 and Psalm Tone 8. Those are the easiest, in my opinion. And one of them is Tristis, sad tone, that's two. And the other one is uh, the sublime tone. So that's a good, good, it's like major and minor key. Tone 2 is minor and uh, tone 8 is major, so very major. And that's a starting place for people. But in terms of what I've done, I've taken it way, way, way deeper. And because I'm a, I'm obsessive about this, I, I want to know, <laughs> well, how does the church sing the intercessions? And there's a way that the church has for singing the intercessions because those mm. are supposed to be sung. So I'm, I'm up on, but it's been like a five year journey of being up on. I know how to sing the intercessions now. I know the four our father tones that we sing. And it's some people might say, well, why confuse it? Why not just do the our father that we all know? Why, why do this specific? Because we're giving God his own praise back to him. This is like, I mean, we're going to do it the way that the angels are doing, or we're going to do it the way that it is written, back to the mm. original idea. It's important how it's written. And we want to offer the best, purest sacrifice ever. We don't want to give God the emaciated lamb that, uh, <laughs> you know, is shivering in the corner and be like, well, all these healthy lambs we're going to eat for ourselves. Yeah. The things I spend my time on is going to be the gym whatever but when it comes to god he'll be happy with this lamb that you know we we didn't like no what 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 we need to put first and foremost as christians above any other secular pursuit is giving god the best worship we possibly can that's the mindset change we need that's the conversion or as christ says circumcise your hearts that's the circumcision of heart that we need to be like no this is the most important and so it's worth learning all for our fathers. They're all simple. Like imagine the low threshold of, um, of, uh, you know, of desire to worship the low threshold. If we're like, let's just do one, our father and end there. Um, we can't learn. We, we can't spend five minutes learning another one. Yeah. And, um, I, I know nobody's really like that. I'm, I'm attacking a red herring because if people were given the tools, I believe most Christians would want to do the, the best possible thing that we could do. So it's it, it, may, it maybe takes conversion, but it just takes also teaching and awareness. We're all sheep without a shepherd here because um, there's so few people who actually like really are committed to doing the church's music, you know? I think I think your point, though, about the difficulty and sometimes our inertia <clears throat> to avoid it you know, this is new. This is hard. This is this is time consuming. This is cumbersome. I don't fully understand it. I mean, there's four thousand. I don't want to say I want to say devilish excuses, but I think there's whispers in our ears saying, "Ah, it's not worth it." You know, or it's not familiar. It's not comfortable, or what have you. Uh, when in fact, I think the majority of people, you know, the, whether it's whether it's our 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 sense of you know hard work and and sacrifice, whatever it is in life, you know, your your professional work, your athletics, your your playing a violin, your singing songs. But especially we got to, with respect to your faith, you know, and anything worth doing is going to be difficult. Oftentimes it's going to it's going to require, you know, again, sacrifice, pain, hard work, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it's profoundly, profoundly um, rewarding. And I, and I do want to say also that I, I think when it comes to prayer, I, I think just if I may just add this, we can't forget God is on the other side of this conversation. Yeah. He's on the other side. I mean, and, and so like you've just described, hearing the, the 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 choirs of the angels in your spiritual ear, it's a profound notion that this is not a cul-de-sac experience. This is this is branching out into the heavens, the vaults that are that are towering, if not endless. And, and to have that connectedness with the sublime, with the source of all that is true, good, and beautiful. Um, to know that you're opening yourself up to this, you're offering praise, and you're not just doing this so that I, my, I just calm my heart down. I mean, it's great that your heart calms down. It's great that you're less anxious. But sometimes, like you said, you're not going to be less anxious. Sometimes your problems aren't going to go away. You're going to have to muddle through them. But the fact of the matter is you're doing this as right praise and opening yourself up to a profound connection with the, with the author of the universe. And my gosh, if we don't have the time, interest, or energy to do that, then what's it all for? You know, so it's, it's incredible. It's incredible what you're undertaking. So I want to, I want to be respectful of your time and I, I, you've, you've kindly plugged the, the word on fire, uh, uh, a liturgy of the hours, monthly book, um, books that have been coming out. So, so word on fires ha has, uh, been issuing these, these, these books since June of 22. 
Um, it's a monthly edition, uh, and, and they're written, and obviously the Sing the Hours is sung, so they're wonderful to be used in tandem. Um, we, we've had thousands of monthly subscribers, and I think I've been told recently about over, almost 600,000 copies has made this the largest initiative in the history of the church to promote the Liturgy of the Hours. And and But but what's amazing, what drew me to you, Paul, and what you're doing is to bring that 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 song of praise to the to the liturgy to to sing the liturgy um just brings it to a, an entirely another level the i've just mentioned the reception that the books have received at word of fire what has been your reception uh what, what what's your sense about the hunger there is out there um for uh singing the hours yeah i think it's it's tied up with our hunger for heaven i mean the the book of revelation demonstrates that people are singing in heaven it's a throng of song and it's like i mean every soul hungers for heaven and the hunger for heaven is not some rote theological statement it has the uh it, it doesn't render it you know mutually exclusive to hunger what heaven sounds like and is like and the qualities thereof um it doesn't mean that you're i i you understand what I'm saying? That like yes. the the hungering of heaven can absolutely include hungering for the music of heaven. Just like yep. me um, wanting to marry my wife could absolutely include um, her amazing food. You know, like yeah. Yeah. it's it, it's not disrespectful to my wife to say, uh, you know, I I can't wait to share meals with you. That's yeah. you know, it's not disrespectful to my wife to say, you know, I can't wait to read do book club with you because I really enjoy that, or I really enjoy going to Red Sox games with you. That's all you know, inclusive of it. So yeah. hunger for heaven can include, yes, being united with Jesus. It can include singing with the saints forever. Um, and I think that uh, to your point, the, the the biggest barrier to all worship is that we don't have use for it and we're obsessed with use. Yeah. We're obsessed with, obsessed with efficiency. So I, I, I think that the what makes it attractive speaks for itself, but I think it's more important to, as you have done, reflect on, well, what are the barriers? Why why doesn't this make sense to us? And you know, as many times as doing the Liturgy of the Hours, singing the Psalms has given me consolation, it's also cut me to the heart. Mm. It's it's uncomfy real, realizing the awful majesty of God, that he's not some like really, uh, yes, he is meek and humble of heart, but he's not some like weakling. Um, He is a mighty warrior. Mm. That sort of like identity of Christ is so... It, the the Psalms will bash you over the head with that. Every Sunday we sing the, I, I, I sometimes like to call it the warlord Psalm where Christ, um, you know, smashes his enemies underfoot and tramples their heads. He crushes them over the wide earth, filling it with corpses. Like that's, and when you say, well, that's the God of the Old Testament. No, Christ says, this is me now. It's the yeah. Psalm 110 is the most, um, the most quoted Psalm in the new Testament about Christ's identity. This is the risen Lord. And we sing it every Sunday on resurrection day to think about what the risen Lord is going to be like. That's not cozy, comfy, comforting. Yeah. That's terrifying. And so that's another reason why it's difficult for us to commit ourselves to the Psalms is because we want to make prayer that we, we like to think of prayer very often as this thing that comforts us. So we like to pray prayers that are comforting. And what the liturgy of the hour says is you're going to pray prayers that are real and not yeah. all reality is comforting. Some reality, some of the prayers are like, I'm so sorry for my sins, Lord. I am a wicked worm. I am a, one of the Psalms says, and I always kind of shiver when I sing it. I am a worm and no man. That's not like God, you know, I'm going to do my prayer time. That's going to make me feel so good. No, today we're going to sing to the Lord. I am a worm. Yes. Is that comforting? No. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is that comforting? No. So it's not necessarily something that's going to change your life in terms of making you, I mean, it will, it, it actually, you know, on the aggregate, absolutely. It is an experience with total bliss. Like he said, like Ambrose said, it's bliss. Psalms are bliss. And even those Psalms you will eventually find as the plant in, in your soul grows, this, 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 this vineyard, as the vines bear fruit, you'll find all of the fruit is the sweetest the sweetest um, wine to to the soul. All of it is a balm. All of it is beautiful. But the way you get there is every every shovel smack on the soil hurts. Every single um, wind, the winds and rains that come, and you feel like you're drowning, that might not be comfortable for 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 the vines in your soul. But the result is complete bliss. 
it's not necessarily useful in the journey. You know what I mean? Prayer is not necessarily all the time joyful and helpful. It's often consoling, but prayer in desolation is the most, um, turns out to be sometimes the most meaningful. Um, so that's the barrier is that, but we can help people along if we sing it because the beauty inherent in the singing, like you said, the soundtrack in the Hollywood film, it's such a, it's such a integral part of it. And so even if, yeah, the word on fire books, if you order them, they might not have notes in them per se, but you can do a psalm tone to anything. Just like I did earlier, I can pull up any page of this. I have my word on fire booklet in front of me now. I could do, you know, um, Psalm tone five, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. The notes are a crutch. You don't need them to do chant. Chant, you, if you learn a couple psalm tones, you can sing it. And the singing definitely makes the plant grow faster. Singing is like high UV fertilizer. It's <laughs> it's everything you need to, to, to get that spiritual vine um, going. And um, I'm from California. I love the Carmel Mission. Love it. It's one of my favorite places to go visit. Uh, Unipro Serra, who was a saint who, who sung, he was renowned in Europe for his singing. Unipro mm-hmm. Serra, most people don't know that. Mm-mm. And he threw he he seemed to throw the usefulness of that away when he went to California to the middle of nowhere and preached the gospel. But no, he used his singing to um, to evangelize. And Robert Louis Stevenson in 1879, he um, went to the one mass a year because the Carmel Mission had broken down. It was it had no roof, but one day a year the priest would come from Monterey to do mass for the Native Americans who had not had a pastor or a shepherd or anyone to preach the gospel to to them for 50 years. They get one mass a year. This is long after the mission has uh, broken down. And and, um, can can I read a short excerpt from his? Please, please. So look it up. It's Robert Louis Stevenson, Carmel Mission. You can find the full uh, newspaper article. This is the former Scottish Protestant atheist, Robert Louis Stevenson, writing about his experience at a Catholic mass in, in a broken down church with no mm. roof and Native Americans leading it who have not had any liturgical training or anything for decades, literally nothing. He says, only one day in the year, the Padre drives over the hill from Monterey. The little sacristy, which is the only covered portion of the church, is filled with seats and decorated for the service. He says... Um, There among the crowd of somewhat unsympathetic holiday makers, you may hear God served with perhaps more touching circumstances than in any other temple under heaven. Mm. I heard the old Indian singing mass. That was a new experience and one well worth hearing. There was the old man who led, the woman who so worthily followed. It was like a voice out of the past. They sang by tradition from the teaching of early missionaries long since turned to clay. And still in the roofless church, You may hear the old music. Padre Casanova will, I am sure, be the first to pardon and understand me when I say the old Gregorian singing preached a sermon more eloquent than his own. Hmm. Peace on earth, goodwill to men, so it seemed to me to say, and to me as a barbarian, he calls himself a barbarian, who hears on all sides evil speech and the roughest bywords about the Indian race. To hear Carmel Indians sing their Latin words with so good a pronunciation and give out these ancient chants with familiarity and fervor suggested new and pleasant reflections. An Indian stone blind and about 80 years of age conducts the singing. Other Indians compose the choir, yet they have the Gregorian music at their finger ends and pronounce the Latin so correctly that I could follow the meaning as they sang. Now here's my favorite part. I have never seen faces more vividly lit up with joy than the faces of those Indian singers. It was to them not only the worship of God, nor an act by which they recalled and commemorated better days, but was besides an exercise of culture where all they knew of art and letters was united and expressed. And it's a beautiful article and it's in the rest of it, but think about it. That's what stuck with them decades later they get one mass a year Mm. and they can sing it perfectly and they can sing it blind that's because what did the evangelizers what did the 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 fathers of california unipro sara prioritize teaching them i've been to the missions every single one of the mission um museums they have uh, up and down the coast of california they'll have a room full of the big mass books and liturgy of the hours books where the chant books are the size of a human being. They're like mm. eight feet big. Mm. And then there's there's a, a couple of, of, of images you can find 
of uh, paintings where, where people observe, you know, 50 Native Americans crowding around one book and all of them learning, learning to read chant. If Indian, if, if Native Americans in the 18th century with no knowledge of the European uh, customs, Latin languages, uh, European music in terms of the scales, da, 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 no background in, in, in anything, complete oblivion in terms of our culture, if they could learn the chants and learn to sing the right. liturgy, right, and they could learn it so well, they could learn it so well that 80 years later, a man, an atheist from Scotland, instead of looking upon it with derision or as a joke, could be moved by the singing and also could understand it because it was so well done. We should be ashamed of ourselves if we can't do that tomorrow. You know what I mean? If, yes. if we can't just humble ourselves to do the music of the church instead of singing at mass or instead of just reading the liturgy, if we can't put on, you know, dress the body of Christ in something beautiful, the greatest art ever, then I think, I think we're not doing, you know, I think we can do a lot more. And I think we're invited to, I think it's in the mind of the church. And I, and I want to call anybody listening. You are, you are imminently able to, it's going to take some learning. It's going to take some unlearning more than anything, because it's simple. It's just speech. Like to chant, I sometimes wish, why can't this be more complicated? Why can't there be notes? Why can't there be, it's all in, in the, you know, it's all in the tradition of the church. It's, it's, it's all within you. You, you could do it on a backpacking trip. You don't need the, the piano or organ. You could do it on the way to work. You could, you could sing liturgy anywhere because the instrument is your soul. The instrument is you. The instrument was created at your baptism and you are designed to sing the praises of God. You are designed to, and it's a beautiful invitation that you can be priest, prophet, and king and you and unite your voices when you do. I'm sure the chants that those Native Americans did in the Carmel Mission, those are all still in our books. They haven't changed a single note. So I'm uniting my voices on Sing the Hours. We are uniting our voices with their voices long dead and with the voices of the people who taught them and with the voices of all the way back to Christ and his apostles. And it's a beautiful thing worth doing. Paul Rose, Catholic musician and creator of singthehours.org. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. It's been a pleasure to spend this time with you. Todd, you're, you're awesome. I love it. Had a great time. So I've been thinking, it is a curious thing. To engage in prayer is to connect oneself to the eternal, the all-knowing, and the ineffable God. It is a step out of our world-weary flesh and into the open arms of the risen Christ. And whether it is prayer through the rich offering of the Liturgy of the Hours, a brief recitation of the Our Father, or a simple guttural cry of, Help me! The Lord hears us and responds. But what happens when we sing our prayers? Something special. According to Paul Rose, we are not only invited to sing some of our prayers, more specifically the Liturgy of the Hours, but in many ways, it is what was intended. There is something about music and worship that changes things. Our posture straightens, our engagement sharpens, our hearts lift up, our worship becomes almost more worshipful. And if we are with others, it draws us into deeper intimacy. This does not mean that spoken prayer is deficient, not at all. That quiet personal encounter is indispensable. That said, Sung prayer can indeed enrich our worship in its own unique way. Music, Leo Tolstoy observed, is the shorthand of emotion. If you are uncertain, watch your favorite film and at the moment of peak poignancy, eliminate the music. Does your heart still swell? Does the lump form in your throat? Does the goose flesh still arise? Not quite. That extra experiential something isn't quite there. To be sure, God is present endlessly and hears all of our prayers, but to listen to Paul Rose sing the hours is to be transported. To engage in sonorous prayer is to lose ourselves in interiority. The soothing musical stream of worship eases us gently, inexorably, into the limitless ocean of God. And this is not something new. Hymns and chants are rooted in the very original forms of our Catholic worship. In my conversation with Paul Rose, he described an inner compulsion, a spiritual mandate 
to break into song out of joy and reverence. Why, after all, would we not sing from the sacred soundtrack of the martyrs? Why would we want the angels in heaven to sing unaccompanied by God's hobbled creatures on earth? Why wouldn't we want to enflesh with music the sacred bones of prayer? In William Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, the smitten Orsino, the Duke of Illyra, pined, If music be the food of love, play on. Likewise, if music be the food of prayer, play on. And one last thing. Instead of a book recommendation today, I want you to listen and sing. Of course, you should visit and partake in singthehours.org. But in addition, I would recommend going to your favorite music outlet and go to your favorite Gregorian chant playlist. I listened to both while penning this reflection, and to be sure, it placed me in that contemplative, worshipful space, a space altogether dangerously encroached upon by noise and worry these days. Pray and sing, and to be God be the glory. Thank you once again for joining me on the Evangelization Culture Podcast. I'm Todd Warner, and until we meet again, keep bringing Christ to a hungry culture.